Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in again. This is a Screencast-O-Matic presentation and recording for the part of the lesson that has us looking at the different types of interest groups. Before we get started, please let me encourage you to open up to today's lesson, and if you haven't done so already, scroll down in the correct section. Please remember that you are to answer the key concept questions that correspond to the content of the reading and then to place the types of interest groups in their correct categorical uh, column. Let's go ahead and get started. Types of interest groups. Few would argue that one person could not make a difference in American politics, but there is power in numbers, and political institutions are more likely to respond to a collective rather than to an individual voice. So an interest group is an organization whose members share common concerns and try to influence government policies affecting those concerns. Interest groups are also known as lobbies, and lobbying is one of the ways in which interest groups shape legislation and bring the views of their constituents to the attention of decision makers. Elected officials as well as the public are often critical of the roles of special interests in the political process, so the activities of lobbyists can smack of vote buying and influence peddling. There are so many organized lobbies today representing numerous segments of society and addressing the, such a wide range of issues, the distinction between special interests and those of American people may no longer be valid. In a sense, interest groups are the American people. There are 23,000 entries in the Encyclopedia of Associations, and a high percentage of them qualify as interest groups. Many have their national headquarters in Washington, D.C. for ready access for legislators and policymakers. Interest groups can be grouped into several broad categories, and here they are. Economic interest groups. Certainly the largest category, economic interest groups include organizations that represent big business, such as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers, as well as Big Labor, the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organization, and the International Brotherhood of Teamsters, for example. Large corporations and individual unions also have offices in the capital. Trade associations represent entire industries, and the members of the American Public Power Association, for example, are municipally owned electric utilities, rural electric cooperatives, and state power authorities. Professionals also form interest groups, like the American Medical Association opposed legislation to create health maintenance in organizations for years. Next are our public interest groups. So public interest groups do not usually expect to profit directly from the policy changes they seek. However, the activists who staff these groups gain financially by attracting donations from individuals and foundations who support their activities. That the name implies, public interest groups enjoy an image of nonpartisanship, even though some of them engage in clearly political activities, such as when Common Cause joined the fight against President George W. Bush's attorney general nominee, John Ashcroft. These groups also receive disproportionately positive news coverage even when there's serious disagreement over their policy proposals. A large number of consumer advocacy groups and environmental organizations, such as the Environmental Defense Fund, fall into this category. Perhaps best known is the League of Women Voters, which promotes simplified voting procedures and an informed electorate, and Common Cause, which backs more effective government. Common Cause is also a strong critic of other interest groups for their excessive campaign contributions, and it lobbies for campaign finance reform. Next are government interest groups. Just so you're aware, government interest groups, given the structure of our federal system, it is not surprising that there are organizations to bring the issues of local and state governments before Congress and the administration. Government interest groups include the National League of Cities, the National Conference of Mayors, and the National Governors Association, and one critical task performed by these groups is to help state and local governments get federal grants. These funds are important because they are central means in which states get money back taken away through federal taxes. Uh, as the budget has tightened and as more Republicans have won governorships, these groups have become more likely to seek more local control over policies instead of more cash. Next are religious interest groups. So the separation of church and state does not preclude religious interest groups from lobbying. Indeed, it is safe to say that all religious groups are involved in politics to some degree, but the Christian coalition, for example, draws upon much of its support from conservative Protestants. And they have an agenda that includes support for school prayer, opposition to homosexual rights, and constitutional amendment banning abortion. It became an important factor in American politics, particularly in the Republican Party in the early 1990s. Next are civil rights interest groups. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the National Organization for Women, and the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force represent groups that historically have faced legal discrimination and, in many respects, continue to lack equal opportunity. Their concerns involve more than civil rights, however, and encompass social welfare, immigration policy, affirmative action, a variety of gender issues, and political action. Ideological interest groups. Ideological interest groups view all issues, federal spending, taxes, foreign affairs, court appointments, and so forth, through the lens of their political ideology, typically liberal or conservative. Their support for legislation or policy depends exclusively on whether they find it ideologically sound. 
Americans for Democratic Action, a liberal group, and an American conservative union rate elected officials by the same standard. A Republican challenger might point to an incumbent's high ADA rating to show that he or she is too liberal to represent the district. And then finally, there's single interest groups. So some single interest groups are formed to advocate for or against a single issue, as the name implies. Although other interest groups may have a position for or against gun control, it is important and only an issue to a political arena for the National Rifle Association and the National Coalition to ban handguns. The same is true of abortion, which pits the National Right to Life Committee and against the National Abortion Rights Action League. These examples are not meant to suggest that single-issue interest groups always generate their opposite, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which campaigns for stiffer sentences for driving while intoxicated and mandatory penalties for the first offense clearly does not. So although most interest groups focus on domestic issues, some are concerned with foreign policy too. Like the American-Israel Public Affairs Committee, for example, focuses on the Middle East and the relationship between the United States and Israel. So as you guys can see, there are plenty of different types of interest groups that exist in our government and society. Understanding the complicated relationship that they have with members of Congress and our ruling government helps us understand a little bit more about the roles that they play and why we should pay more attention. And of course, if we need to, join interest groups that fit our interests to advocate for ourselves and our interests as well. Thank you very much for tuning in and good luck with completing the rest of the lesson.